thank you, everybody. And I think that's the first time I've heard it introduced that way, where I heard, thank you for coming to AA 110 questions. We don't have 110 questions. It is just 10. And welcome to the ninth session of this 10-week series. What is knowledge? What do I know is the topic for this evening. This is our penultimate session of 10 questions. And one of our guests this evening asked if I could work the word penultimate in early, so check, done. Um, how do we know what penultimate means? Most of us know what the word means, but we don't know exactly how we know that. We just do. And with that, I introduce tonight's topic, which is to stand back from our daily lives organized around the acquisition of, presentation of, conservation of knowledge of various kinds. And I'm thinking especially of you students who will be tested on knowledge in a couple of weeks' time in various classes, to think instead about the larger topic or idea. This very very special, very human, almost incomparable concept that we have of knowledge in the world and how that concept relates to or differs from things very close to it, like ideas, like information, like many other things that seems to sit closely aside this very human quality and concept. Um, to ask what is knowledge, I think if we think about it for a minute, is very abstract, almost obscure or obtruse compared to some of the questions we've asked over the last couple of months. If you think of beauty, failure, time, big human or at times intensely personal ideas, to ask what is knowledge, you got to admit, sounds a little bit know-it-all like and a very UCLA kind of thing, right? Um, it is, however, by design, a question that's going to lead us into the final one of this series, which is to contemplate what is a university. And we're joined by some terrific guests this evening who are going to help us with that work. Um, I'm old enough, I think, to be comfortable in saying, I feel like I know what I know, and I know what I don't know. One of the incredible pleasures of being a dean at a school like the School of the Arts and Architecture at UCLA is I spend my days literally with people who know way more than I do, including you students, I promise. You know things that most of us at my age can't even imagine, let alone comprehend. What all of us focus on, though, in our daily lives as we contemplate that kind of reality is, of course, who it is we might turn to, how it is we might think, how it is we relay that thing we treat as knowledge. And tonight's work is going to continue that sort of thinking. Um, that said, for me, there are three things I do know about knowledge. The first is it's incredibly valuable and arguably more valuable than ever at a time described in relation to an idea like knowledge economies that suddenly place more value in literal monetary terms on ideas than it often will on hard stuff like bricks and mortar, glass or steel. The second thing I know is that knowledge is vulnerable, particularly, you could say, in an era of fake news or rampant conspiracy theory industries. Whatever it is, is something that we all need to think carefully about protecting and not just conserving. And finally, knowledge is endur endurable. It is enduring and an enduring feature of who and what we are as a species. Whatever else it is, knowledge is something we humans produce and value. It's something we share, we broadcast, we socialize. We occasionally monetize or even monopolize in spectacular and unexpected ways. A final way in which we might think about the importance of asking questions about what is knowledge today. So with that, um, as something less than a knowledgeable introduction, 
I would ask you to welcome with me our guests this evening who are going to do work sharing their knowledge on the bigger question of what knowledge is. Everybody, Christy Edmonds, Victoria Marks, Marcelo Suarez Orozco, and Todd Presner. <laughs> Come on in, you guys. Thank you so much. A brief introduction for each of our guests and then we're gonna get on with the evening. On the far side, Christy Edmonds is an artist, a curator, an artistic director, and frequent international consultant, in addition to being the executive and artistic director of UCLA Center for the Art of Performance. Christy's reputation for innovation and depth relates to her presentation of contemporary art across all disciplines, with a particular emphasis on contemporary performing arts. In collaboration with master artists, she has curated unique forms that survey the breadth of their artistry while placing equal emphasis on the support and commissioning of new work by some of today's leading performance creators. Everybody, Christy Edmonds. Thank you, thanks for coming in. Victoria Marks, here closest to me, is a choreographer and, I'm very pleased to say, our Associate Dean of Academic Affairs here at UCLA School for the Arts and Architecture. Victoria is a professor of choreography in the UCLA Department of World Arts and Cultures, which has as its home this wonderful building, Kaufman Hall, where she has been teaching since 1995. She creates dances that consider the politics of citizenship, as well as the representation of both virtuosity and disability for the stage, for film, and in community settings. As you know, Victoria is also the one who conceived of and developed this 10 questions course to build in her words, oh, it's wonderful. To build in her words, vital cross-university conversations as we work towards understanding the unique perspectives of each discipline across larger equations of knowledge. Marcelo Suarez Arasco is a psychological anthropologist and the Wasserman Dean of the UCLA Graduate School of Education and Information Studies. Marcelo's research focuses on conceptual and empirical problems in the areas of cultural psychology and psychological anthropology with an emphasis on the study of mass migration, globalization, and education. An immigrant from Argentina, Marcelo is a product of the California Master Plan, having studied in community college and at Berkeley where he received his PhD. And in January, Pope Francis appointed Dean Suarez Orozco to the Pontifical Academy of the Social Sciences. Everyone, Marcelo Suarez Orozco. And finally, Todd Pressner is a digital humanist, a cultural critic, historian, and rock climber. <laughs> we'll see which of those skills we use most immediately this evening. Um, and the founding chair of UCLA's Digital Humanities Program and Ross Professor of Germanic Languages in comparative literature. Since 2018, he is Associate Dean of Digital Innovation in the Division of the Humanities here at UCLA and advisor to Vice Chancellor of Research for Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences Research. Todd's research focuses on European intellectual history, the history of media, visual culture, digital humanities, and cultural geography. Everybody, Todd Pressner. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming in. Um, welcome all, and we will begin as we do every week with short presentations by each of our guests. We have an agreed order, and we're going to begin this evening with Victoria Marks. Thank you, Brett Steele, and thank you all for being here. And I particularly want to thank Emery Burke, Kylie Kerrigan, and Louise Kale, who have been my compatriots. And creating these events, these, this class and these public events. So thank you to all of you. Um, I'm a choreographer, and I want to bring the body into the question, what is knowledge? I think of the body as a source of knowing. And actually, I was looking at the biography I often use when I'm presenting my biography to people, and it often says, Victoria Marks practices knowing and unknowing, making dances for stage and film. I thought about that, 
And actually, I really, really like the idea of unknowing because it, I like knowing so much that if I unknow it, I can do it again, I can um, know things differently and see things anew. So I want to step aside from um, my, my presentation for a moment. I just want to ask you all, how are you feeling? Good. Okay, so-so. I get a little so-so, some great. great. And um, you know, I'm wondering if maybe you're a little bit tired because it's the end of a long day. Nope. Yeah. yeah. Hungry because it's dinner time. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, maybe maybe a little bit horny because you're young and wild. <laughs> Most everybody is young and wild. Okay. Well, I, actually, I just it's time now to get back to my lecture, and I just want to ask you to put your mind over matter, please. And for those of you who are still thinking about horny and kind of checking in on that, get your mind out of the gutter. OK. The way I understand this is, if we look back into European history, Rene Descartes attempted to prove the nature of human existence through the action of thought in what has become a fundamental paradigm of, for knowledge, we remember his words. OK, in two languages. I think, therefore, I am. Oh, excuse me. Would you mind? Stand up, please. Thank you so much. They've already agreed to this before. Um, we have the mind and the body. And um, I just wanted to give you a visual on this, because um, in, in Descartes' thinking, the mind and the body were separable and distinct. So the mind often referred to a higher plane of knowledge, and the body <laughs> would be living in the muck or the gutter of living itself. We might think of the mind as culture, and we might think of the body as nature or the place where all the shit happens, literally. Um, I, first of all, these guys were just so generous to do this. I just want to thank you, and um, I will carry on. I will carry on. Um, the other week, Susan Foster, in talking about the body, said that it's redundant to say embodied knowledge. What she was telling us is that knowledge is embodied. So let's not look at the body as an object to be studied, but actually as a source for knowing. OK, next choreographic enterprise. Um, everything we know comes from our experience. We're in a continuous sensory conversation with what's going on outside of us and inside of us. Now, we might think about the body's um, inside being contained by the membrane of the skin or its, its connection to the outside through the membrane of the skin. But actually, as a choreographer, I think of it, I think of the ends of our body more as our kinosphere, the space around our bodies. But if you drive a car, um, which, how many of you do drive a car? <laughs> Quite a few of you. OK. Sometimes when you're in a car a lot, that car feels as though it's the outer membrane of your body, right? And sometimes in the best of times we're in a room, when we're in a room together and something happens that we're all a part of in which we are transformed, we feel that we are collectively an organism and we share a membrane of understanding and we take what happens in that room outside and we affect what's going on outside the world that, of the room. Um, listen, I just want to apologize to you now because um, I'm really sorry. I, I, I had to lie down, but um, I know, and I know it was the wrong thing to do. Uh, but I did it for a reason, because I'm trying to point out the knowledge we have of the appropriate bodily comportment within the circumstances of a lecture. You are all admirably, admirably demonstrating your understanding 
of how it is to be in a lecture. You're sitting quietly. Most of you are looking at me. Your eyes are open. You're breathing quietly. Um, if you've got your computer open, you're probably taking notes. Um, so I think that that demonstrates that we have a shared knowledge about what is, what's appropriate for being in a lecture. But just to take that a step further, I'd like to, first of all, I'd like to, can anybody whistle like this? OK, thank you. Um, the next time you hear that whistle, I'd like to invite everyone here to misbehave. Now, um, just a couple of rules. Don't hurt yourself. Don't hurt the person next to you. And please don't wreck the property. Um, you have 10 seconds to misbehave. When you hear the whistle the second time, please, please stop. OK? All right, ready? Thank you very much. So you know what misbehavior is, proving that you know what the appropriate behavior is. And for those of you who refused my offer, was there anyone who refused my offer? OK. Well, I can think of two things. Either you um, have so absorbed the authoritative requirements for being in a lecture, maybe you felt that you, you couldn't really misbehave. Or, and I bet it's the second, you were asked to transgress, and you th thought to yourself, oh, the authoritative voice in the room is asking me to transgress. And so if I transgress, that is not transgressing. And therefore, if I sit still and I don't transgress, then I will be really thwarting the appropriate behavior in the moment. I see you nodding your heads yes, so now I know. <laughs> OK, here's my next act. We elevate some kinds of knowledge and dismiss others, right? OK. Consider the many everyday techniques you know. And um, let's, for example, think about the technique of driving. How many of you drive? OK, good. And we know that, uh-oh. <laughs> we know that you drive. OK, listen, we know that you drive very, very well because you're here. Right? And how many of you, I mean, and, oh, never mind, I'm not going to ask for numbers, but also most of us know the appropriate comportment and etiquette for eating. Is that correct? Good. So we can have dinner together. But basically, these are techniques. They are techniques in which you have, which you have perfected or quickly, hopefully, will soon perfect your skills in these areas. and. Um, you do that through repetition. You just do it over and over and over again until it begins to feel natural, right? So nothing actually is natural, but we have the experience of something we've learned as being natural when we have repeated it so often that we no longer have to bring an attenuated focus to every next move. We have absorbed that knowledge. OK, as long as that's clear. <laughs> um, when you do a headstand, by the way, I can do a headstand, but um, I'm just a little nervous to do it right now. Um, <laughs> but when you do a headstand at a club or at a party <laughs> or maybe like in a lecture hall or at home in your living room, you are displaying technique. And you are demonstrating a set of skills knowledge. And when you're really, really good, you're able to generate new ideas within your head standing technique. And I'll just let you imagine what that could be. All dancers study technique, whether in the studio or on the street. And mastery of technique allows for a freedom within that technique. But what I want to say here is technique is not about learning movement alone, not at all. When you practice a technique, whether dancing or eating dinner or driving your car or washing, 
you enact a set of beliefs and values. All techniques are philosophical practices that locate personhood and also collective beliefs. Each technique puts us in the world in its own way. Dancing is ephemeral, like life. It leaves no tangible trace. It's here and gone. And when dancers work, their labor leaves no object, no commodity that can be owned or sold. Only, as in life, a visceral memory of lives fully lived, precariously and with great love. If we view our bodies as things, as objects to be studied, controlled, and subdued, then by extension, we have a template through which to objectify and control others. We're accustomed to thinking of power, the dominion of some people over other people, some communities over other communities, nations over nations, humans over animals, humans over the earth. And when we, in the hubris of our own elevated status, look down at animals or other people, this reductive act diminishes knowledge and then we call it instinct. And that enables us to kill. When we attempt to control the body, to treat the body as an object that we subdue, which may be in part necessary for our survival, that same act of control can be a form of assault on knowledge itself. What if, Instead of positioning knowledge solely as an act of the mind, a state of dominion over the body, we considered the body as a source of knowledge and a way of knowing. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you so much. Everybody, Trod Presser. Okay. Can I grab the, huh? grab the clicker? Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Um, it's really a, a pleasure to be able to participate in this uh, experiment with you all. And, and thank you, uh, Victoria and Brett and my colleagues for allowing me to be here and share some thoughts. When I think about the question, what is knowledge, um, immediately I begin to proliferate a whole set of other questions. Um, whose knowledge are we talking about? Where is this knowledge? Where do we find it? Um, how did it become knowledge in the first place? Who's credentialed it? Uh, who's certified that that's knowledge there, that's not? Um, why this knowledge as opposed to some other kind of knowledge? And as someone that works in the field of, I, I imagine you heard a little bit, digital humanities is one thing I do. I work with media, but I also am a historian. Uh, I work particularly on, on German and German Jewish history, and I'll get to that in a moment. But I also think about knowledge that's buried and silenced or submerged. And I wonder a lot about knowledge that becomes lost and what it means to find that knowledge, to excavate it, and particularly when it comes to voices that have been erased or obliterated from the cultural record. That to me becomes a politics of knowledge and really in some ways lays forward the ethical stakes of the entire enterprise of what we do at a university. Where is knowledge? Well, oftentimes we think of things like this, grandiose spaces, right? The Library of Congress, beautiful, masterful, architectural, ornate uh, reading rooms, and then the storehouses of knowledge in stacks and libraries, and they're organized in nice boxes, right? They're cataloged and they're organized and classified because knowledge is always organized and classified. And insofar as we think about classification systems, we realize those too are political. Well, if we go to the history of even the word archive, we already connect it with power. It comes from the Greek term archeon. It means a house or a domicile, but not just any domicile or anyone's house, but the domicile of the superior magistrates who are the archeons, those who command. And so knowledge is something that's guarded. Right? Some people have access to it, can get into the archive, other people do not. And that already tells me that we have to think about the nexus between knowledge and power from the get-go. The Mercator projection, 1569, an amazing feat. Google Maps uses it today because it's useful for navigation. It doesn't distort in the way other maps do. 
very useful for um, ship trade, ship navigation, slave trade as well. Printing press, uh, of course, it disseminates knowledge to the world, but of course it creates a public that can read another public that it maybe is illiterate. We think of the scribal tradition of writing down texts, of translating them, who's overseeing them, what texts get translated, what texts get lost, or the idea of codification of knowledge into great books, you know, philosophical tradition. I read these great books when I was in college, and I was like, oh, this is the great books, this is knowledge, it's right there. Uh, as it turns out, it, it's a really small fraction of knowledge. So I always have to think about knowledge is not just about power, it's also about empowerment, because we, can, we have the ability to speak, speak, speak back. And you have to ask the question, who can speak? In what languages? In what media? How are they credentialed? By whom? Uh, what institutions and communities are involved in organizing and preserving knowledge? And especially insofar as we think about applications of knowledge, how does knowledge lead to action? What does it mean that we know something? Do we actually act on it? Do we do something about it? Um, amazing exhibition right now by Adrian Piper at the Hammer that deals with exactly this issue. I work in the field of Holocaust and genocide studies. This, uh, obviously, it's, it's a difficult field in a lot of ways. But genocide, the term genocide means the killing of a race. In German, they use the term Vernichtung, which means annihilation, uh, to refer to what the Nazis were going to do, not just to the Jews, but especially Jews and other groups that they considered to be subhuman. It's not only about the destruction of a people, but it's also the destruction of knowledge. It's the destruction of culture. It's the destruction of society. It's the destruction of the historical record, and that's really what's at stake when we begin to think about power and power over others. Hannah Arendt, a great uh, German Jewish philosopher who herself escaped Nazi Germany, wrote about the origins of totalitarianism in 1951, about fascism, about Stalinism. So he says the goal of totalitarianism is to see that the victim never existed at all. And very hauntingly quotes a survivor who says, when no witnesses are left, there can be no testimony. Well, witness means to know. Someone who witnesses things knows them. He or she experienced something. It's not just ocular, not just that you saw it, but that you experienced it. You went through something. And to testify is to bring knowledge to others, right? It's to attest, it's to bear witness, it's to provide evidence or proof. I saw this, this happened, I was there, and this is what happened. So to destroy those things is to destroy knowledge. This is the last year, last really months of the liquidation of the Warsaw Ghetto in 1943 before these people were shipped out to Treblinka where they're almost all gassed. In the archive uh, that was created in the Warsaw Ghetto, a man named Emanuel Ringelblum, a historian, decided to collect documents of what people were experiencing in these horrific years of 1941, 42, 43. And he decided to know about everyday life. What were people experiencing? He wrote, not a single fact should be omitted. Let the world read and know what the murderers have done. What did they do with the archive? They buried it. They buried it in the ground deep in the ground in metal boxes. After the war, three people survived who knew about where this archive was. They dug it up in 1946 and 1951, only parts of it. Part of it's been lost. It was in milk crates. It was in metal boxes. And what was inside were testimonies of people who were themselves killed. These were last words. These were wills. These were letters. These were sermons. These were newspaper clippings. They were reports in multiple languages. But it was knowledge meant to be shipped to the future shipped out of the Warsaw Ghetto. And it was so precarious because what's the chances that anyone would survive to actually know where it was, to dig it up, and then to recognize it as knowledge and say, this is important, it's worth preserving. I've been interested in this concept of sending messages to the future for a long time. And I'm particularly struck by the idea of putting a message in a bottle. Like, why would you put a message in a bottle? Like, where are you sending it to? Especially if you don't know you're ever gonna survive. A woman from Robinsbrook, a woman's concentration camp who made art and buried it in a bottle that was only dug up years later. Or a sketchbook, amazingly, from Auschwitz, found in a bottle in 1947. We don't have photographs from Auschwitz. We have these sketches. We don't know who made them. We have no idea. They're not signed. And yet they bear witness to people being exterminated almost in a photographic-like way. I'm haunted to think more, as I think about this question, I've been thinking a lot more comparatively beyond my field of Holocaust and genocide studies 
And I began to think about what messages and bottles have never been found. What about that other milk crate that was also buried in the Warsaw Ghetto? It's never been found. We don't know where it is. What messages and what knowledge, what witnesses, uh, what lives were, are contained in it? Well, think about it this way. This is the history of slavery told through slave ships. What you see running there is an amazing database pre pre uh, presented by a number of collaborators across the world at Emory University detailing slave ships coming from west coast of Africa to the Americas, to Brazil, to Jamaica, to Cuba, to North America. It details hundreds of years. Each dot is a slave ship. Each dot represents somewhere between 300 and 500 slaves. Where are their messages, their voices? Who bears witness to them, right? How do we begin to excavate the submerged knowledge? This question, to me, is a very profound one as we begin to think about the historical record. Most of the time, what we have in the historical record are the documents of the perpetrators. We have the documents of the legal decisions about particular things that happen. We have the charters of the ships. We have the records of how many slaves were taken, how many died in the Middle Passage, and how many arrived, and where they were enslaved. We have their ages. We have their gender. We often don't even have their names. This particular, um, this particular report is, is very important because it's the Zong uh, slave ship, which the owners of the ship, in the course of the, of the journey, threw overboard 150 slaves and then decided that they had lost their cargo and made a claim against their insurers to be compensated. The only record of this is the historical record, the legal documents that was produced in this debate. We know nothing of the people. Again, submerged voices, submerged witnesses. Toni Morrison, I think, is someone who begins to think about how literary and historical knowledge can go together. And one thinks about the millions of people that she says disappear without a trace because they never arrive safely on shore. It's like a whole nation that's under the sea. Her approach is to think about literary knowledge. How does literary knowledge complement historical knowledge? How can literature poetic thinking, and ways of looking at the archive bring a truth or shed a light on people that were destroyed who have no voices, who had no archive. She says, only an act of the imagination can help me. Her idea of only an act of the imagination, this is not fictionalizing in the sense of making it up, but of adding to the historical record in order to show the silences that exist there. My last example is a poet who makes use particularly of the Zong case, uh, Norbesse Philip, an extraordinary book of poems that came out in 2007 where she takes that legal report that I showed you earlier, this report here, and takes apart the words, pries apart the language in order to look for not only the ways in which language is connected to power, but also those voices, the people that have been left out. She says in here, and it's really quite amazing, it's a reference our fellow creatures may become the subject of property. This, therefore, was a throwing overboard of goods, and part of it was to save the residue, why they threw the slaves overboard. They were essentially goods, like wood, is what the report says. She takes these words and rewrites them. She takes them, they kind of are submerged. Some of them come forward, some of them come backwards, some of them are rewritten, um, but in every case, it's to bring poetic knowledge to show the absences in the historical record. I'll leave you with a quote from Norbisi Philip because I think it's so telling. There's no telling the story, right? In fact, the story can't be recovered, but it must be told. This paradox, right, this tension, if it can't be told, it must be told. Zong, her book about this slave ship, bears witness to the resurfacing of the drowned and the oppressed, transformed this desiccated legal report into a cacophony of voices wails, cries, moans, and shouts that had earlier been banned from the text. This, I think, is really the ethical stakes of knowledge. Thank you. Thanks, Todd. Thank you, Todd. Thanks so much. Everybody, Marcelo Suarez Orozco. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you, Brett, for inviting me, and thank you, uh, to my colleagues here at the stage and my colleagues in the audience, and I look forward uh, 
uh, really more to the conversation. Uh, I have a few um, reflections that flow from the work of, of, uh, of our colleagues, and um, I just want to enumerate them uh, in order. Uh, Brett, you started us with um, knowledge and its unique attributes. Um, and I, I was thinking as you were speaking that perhaps what is uniquely human uh, is the accumulation uh, and the accumulated transmission of, um, of knowledge as perhaps one of the uniquely human attributes. Uh, we don't have to reinvent the grammar of the French language. Uh, once it's articulated, it has a life that is transgenerational. Uh, so the accumulation of knowledge, we'll get to that, the, the, the question of what that is, may be a uniquely human um, attribute. I think perhaps another uniquely human capacity I was reflecting upon your comments, Brett, uh, had to do with your reflection on how do we know that we know something? And that, of course, speaks to something that is un the, maybe the, the, the jewel in the crown, what cognitive neuroscientists call the metacognitive, uh, the so-called executive function of the central nervous system. This, again, may be uniquely human capacity to reflect upon our knowing, the so-called metacognitive um, architecture that is so, marred, so much a part of who we are um, as, um, as a species. Um, Victoria, your, your, your work with the body, it's so amazing, and of course the body knows, and uh, Pascal has a beautiful line when he says, and I think he means more broadly, he has a line, the heart knows of reason for which reason has no reason. Mm -hmm. That there are ways the body knows that are other than the, 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 the binary logic of the Cartesian sort of um, uh, world of uh, mind and body, culture, nature. Um, so uh, I, 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 uh, I applaud you for uh, reminding us how much of the human experience and of human evolution is, uh, is the work of the body does for our, in terms of our orientation um, to the world. Um, Todd, of course, I was very moved by your, by your reflections, and um, this, I think, is why acknowledgement and the politics of acknowledge, acknowledgement become so central to the, to the endeavors to heal the extraordinary damage human beings can do to each other. Uh, and think of the Truth and Reconciliation Committees in South Africa, in Latin America, in so many parts of the world where, of course, H Helene Scarry has a beautiful line in her, in her book, The Body in Pain, on torture. And she says, of course, in torture, if pain can be represented. We, we don't have language. It's unknowable, the pain of others. Not unlike what Adorno said about the truth is buried in the ashes. And we, we can endeavor to excavate it, but it's a very incomplete and a very imperfect. Uh, so knowledge and acknowledgement are so central to the work of suffering in, uh, in, um, in, the human, uh, in the human condition. So these are some reflections to my comments, to my colleagues in the spirit of, of conversation. So knowledge, knowledge, how do we know? I'll start wearing my hat here as the Dean of the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies at UCLA, and I'll start with the following claim, that knowledge is dangerous, and uh, proceed with caution when you're dealing with knowledge, but let me say, make this claim. It is a fundamental pillar of, let's put it very broadly, civilization. The great H.G. Wells, 150 years ago, said, 
History now is a race between education and catastrophe. Well, if you know something, you know who's winning that race today. So knowledge is a fundamental pillar of democracy, of uh, civilization. This is why the great John Dewey, in his book, Democracy and Education, puts education, puts, puts the knowing citizen at the center of the work of democracy. And prophetically, Dewey says, the work of democracy is the work that each generation needs to renew. And it's renewed through, in his wisdom, education. His main argument is education is not a preparation for life. Education is life, and democracy lives in the work education does for all of us. So this is sort of the first broad claim about knowledge, a pillar for, uh, especially again, as Brett got us started, in, in the current world where knowledge and facts and um, reality are, are contested in the most savage sort of fundamental ways where language is kidnapped from us and all the shared understandings that are fundamental to the work of knowledge are uh, ephemeral. Now, more formally, when we think about knowledge, of course, and this is something that Victoria articulated for us, uh, we think uh, in terms of uh, knowledge is, uh, co no, no, is co cognition, knowledge, conocer, conocere, these are all cognate uh, words, and they flow from two separate sort of very, very basic constitutive units. One is experience and familiarity, the habits that the body knows often better than the, than, the, uh, than the mind. This is what the great William James calls experience near knowledge. The knowledge that comes from the habits. Uh, knowledge is a cognate word of uh, familiarity also. is that which comes to us as a way of knowing that is familiar, that we are at ease with. So that's one of the ways of entering a, a, uh, an approach to, um, to uh, knowledge, what I think you call natural uh, knowing. Um, of course, we are in the university, and the, in the, the university is in the business of what we will call ways of knowing that are organized, and they tend to be organized into the disciplines. We had a brilliant uh, um, discussion by, by Todd that very much flows from the architecture of a set of disciplinary understandings that are shared, they're common, they're habits that we form, and in a university, knowledge tends to live in disciplinary uh, habits, habitats. We have historical ways of knowing, geographical ways of knowing, uh, philosophical ways of knowing, architectural ways of knowing, uh, and the like. Now, immediately, something very fascinating begins to happen, which is there is a reason why knowledge over the centuries became organized around systems that we come to call disciplines. And that is, well, what happens where the disciplines come um, um, to converse? What happens when uh, I, I when, before I, became, I joined the, the dark side and I became an administrator, I was a regular academic. I was a regular scholar who did regular research and wrote regular books and, and articles, right? And that lives very much within disciplinary traditions. But what's very interesting today, and I think it's been very interesting really since the beginning of the organization of disciplines, is the idea of interdisciplinary work, work that spills over and can't be contained. And the work that interdisciplinarity does for us is in many ways, 
it comes full circle to the issue of familiarity. Because interdisciplinary work fundamentally interrupts the taken for granted familial practices that come to uh, colonize disciplinary work, right? So if you're a psychologist, psychologists have a handshake. I, I've, I've been married to a psychologist for 42 years. I think finally I discovered what their secret handshake is. They have secret rituals, they have secret knowledge. They practice in very, they, they practice their discourse in very uh, uh, um, exotic journals. Uh, <laughs> and they each, other, they each other, they read each other's journals. It's almost like the secret societies of the Arunta or the Arunda or, and, and what's very fascinating is the, the, the approach and avoidance that comes with our endeavors to uh, work within disciplinary bodies of knowledge, ways of knowing, and the kinds of disruptions that come with a conversation between disciplines. I'm going to take three minutes to show you um, representations of a domain of scholarship, which is the area of work where I'm engaged in, which is the study of, um, it's the study of the mass movements of people. And what I'd like to, to show you is representations. These are bodies of knowledge that have become instantly recognized. This is something that every demographer in the galaxy, including the ones they're gonna find in Mars now, it will recognize immediately as a body of knowledge about this is the world, and this is where people, uh, uh, originate, the, the, the uh, three or four issues that dominate the movements of people in the 21st century. All continents are involved in sending people, what we call emigration, uh, transit, immigration, and return migration, right? So here you have the world as represented um, in this, this is a little bit uh, more orderly, more uh, 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 obvious uh, for you to, uh, to sort of reflect upon uh, what's going on in the world. Asia is the epicenter of the movement of people. Asia is the epicenter, epicenter of everything in the 21st century. So if you think you have a caravan coming to your country, that's not really where the action is. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to, to tell you, you can, you can put that on, you can tweet that one, because that's not where the action, yeah. Maybe you know who Caligula would, uh, could respond to that. And this is another representation, this falls very much within the domain of the social sciences. Uh, this to me represents why people migrate, you know. Uh, to my definition of migration is an ethical act of and for the family, and it's love and work. It's, it's a migration, it's an act of love for the family, and it's an act of, uh, of uh, uh, so love and work are the main drivers of migration. And I think that this, in a way, captures, right, as a, as a kind of, this is monumental art, this is a, a beautiful um, um, sculptural representation of, of that. And this, to me, represents the problematic of the 21st century. This is, uh, uh, we, do we know what this is? Yes. What is this? Guernica. The Guernica. What, what, what is Guernica? The Spanish Civil War. Yes. Guernica, right? This is a Picasso. Where did it hang? This hang in the UN for many years until um, Franco died because Picasso wouldn't let it be back in Spain. Now it's in the Reina Sofia. It's very spectacular. And here we bear witness to war and terror. This is what's driving the movement of people today. If you want to understand what's going on, uh, you know, uh, the miles from here, the people are escaping war and terror and environmental collapse. So the Guernica to me is really the most fundamental representation as a kind of a bare witness of, um, of the horror of war. Um, Todd uh, uh, Franco allowed the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, to bomb Guernica. Uh, Franco was uh, Galician, and Guernica is in the Basque country. 
uh, Orozco is a Basque name, I'm, 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 I'm Basque, I'm part Basque. And he allowed the Germans to do practice runs. So this was just practice, this was in real war. So this was the destruction of a, of a town, the town of Guernica. And of course it has the horror, the unrepresentability, this uh, is unspeakable of the horror of, of, of the war. Uh, the bull, of course, is us, is the witness, because we need to bear witness to the, to the destruction of, uh, of um, that human beings are, are um, capable. Uh, we are wolf, what the, man is wolf to man, is a line in Hobbes, I think, in, um, uh, as a, as a, so these, in a way, give you a, a kind of artistic representations of the movements of people, what people, why people have to leave, why people come to new, uh, to new destinations, uh, and this fall more within the realm of the social sciences, uh, the, the demographics, uh, cultural geography, and the, the disciplines that are so well represented um, in uh, the scholarly study of the, the mass movements of, uh, of people. Ways of knowing are incomplete. Uh, ways of knowing are in fundamental ways constructed and reconstructed. And it is fundamentally impossible to separate, broadly speaking, what we call a, the scientific ways of knowing and the artistic ways of knowing, the humanistic ways of knowing. And I think that these representations of knowledge about this very defining issue in our world today tell the story of the partial ways we endeavor to, through knowledge, approximate and model the world we live in, our experiences as a species, and as our ambitious as some moral creatures in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Marcelo. Marcelo, thank you so much. And our final presentation, Christy Edmonds. <laughs> okay, wow. I just gotta say that right now. Wow, wow, triple wow. Um, a few things in terms of my ways of knowing is that I'm gonna throw out a lot of what it was that I thought I was going to say <laughs> so that I can connect a way of knowing what I'm experiencing to what you might be experiencing, right? So I just wanna talk to the students and obviously the public a little bit, but, but let me ask a few, a, a few sequenced kind of questions, okay? Um, Okay, and you can raise your hands. These are kind of bifurcated ors, right? Information or facts? Information, hands up, that you value more. Facts, okay. Facts or data? Facts, data. Ooh, data's pulling ahead. Information or experience? Information, experience. Right? Do you guys love this? Aren't I a genius? Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> knowledge or skills? Knowledge, skills. Okay. Skills or wisdom? Skills, wisdom. How are y'all gonna get there? <laughs> Perception or knowledge? Perception. Knowledge. Knowledge or wisdom? Knowledge, wisdom. Wisdom wins again. <laughs> Food or air? <laughs> Food, air. Okay. High levels of interdependency across all that terminology, right? Right? Total utter interdepend interdependency. How data might move to information, information to fictions, fictions to facts, fictions to consciousness, fictions to lies, 
lies to truths, truths to knowledge, whose knowledge, whose truth, whose lie, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So everything that we were talking about around what is experienced, lived experienced is a body of knowledge that lives in our body through every sensory apparatus that we possibly have. So when I was first thinking about how do I, I'm not, I haven't even talked about what I do, sorry about that, but part of what I've been thinking about amongst the true and utter challenge of trying to figure out how to, do you define it, do you explore it, do you noodle with it, I've been doing all that for weeks. But to me, one of the things that's really critically, critically, critically important is what you guys just did. You put your hands up by the mass majority around the idea of wisdom as the thing you value most. And yet, human history, as have dem been demonstrated here by quite a, my question is often not so much what is knowledge, but what is it that we do with it? And in the doing of that is all other kinds of other words in the vernacular and so on and so forth. What we do with it and what we hope to do with it probably has some leaning towards how do we acquire wisdom. Wisdom through knowledge and consciousness and the body and the mind and every other interdependent system that we possibly have is utterly, utterly, utterly independent. And consciousness to me is one of the single pieces of what I do professionally with working with artists as a curator. So I wanted to just back up quickly because in thinking of this project in this topic in this discussion for me <clears throat> I think about what is the knowledge that I have because it was gifted and a gift can be learned or earned but it's a gift an education benevolent infrastructure so on and so forth the people the family the influencers etc cetera, etc cetera. what is the knowledge that I have that was given to me someone cared enough to transmit that knowledge. What is the knowledge that I sought out and found? What did I pursue to know? Which is something else in another kind of way. And what is the knowledge that I now have that's even worth passing on, right? What will I transmit? I have to say honestly that as a curator and artistic director, I have worked, I have probably learned not everything, I don't want to make a sweeping generalization, but I have probably learned almost everything that I know through the avenues of the arts. From very early age with my mother, my grandmother, various other people, all the way up. And the reason is because in the arts, the outcomes are unknown, they're not locked and fixed, and the burning thing that runs across it is a passionate life that is seeking to find form and continuously asking certain kinds of questions. The question that I think, whether no matter what discipline it is, whatever, whether it's visual practice, cinema, whether it's you know, design media, choreography, theater, storytelling, poetry, et cetera, et cetera, the question that an artist asks and logs gazillions of hours in the asking is the question of where to from here, how to proceed, how best to proceed. At a micro level, how do I cross the stage? Where to from here in a choreographic realm, in time and space? And in theater, what line next? What words next? In writing, the pen on the page, where to from here? Architecture, et cetera, et cetera. The question is asked, the question is practiced. And it leads to a body of knowledge that continuously opens a door for more questions. And of course, artists are involved quite deeply in the question at a very small molecular level, like I was describing, but it's also a question that is very meta about us, where to from here, how best to proceed, how to proceed, in what form, in what way. And my job as a curator is literally to work with artists in all different mediums where they're imaginative, passionate, and hyper-knowledgeable mind, body, soul, spirit, consciousness is asking a bunch of these questions. And I'm entrusted with it at its most vulnerable. The trust piece is an acknowledgement, acknowledge, knowledge. The trust piece is how do I share a vulnerable idea in order to get it out there in a way 
that others can commingle co and collaborate with it, amplify, push me in different kinds of directions, and then find form, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So to me, almost every form of artistic knowledge that I've ever encountered is the knowledge proposition around knowledge exchanged as a gift. And that the gift in a society is something that forces us also, in this era, know a lot about economics, right? Shall we say. Artists, because the outcome is not always known, it can't always be collect, it can't always be collected, it can't be turned into a commodity. Art is a gift. The artists who endeavor to make it are utilizing every system of sensory knowledge plus training, plus skill, plus, 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 to find an avenue through which to keep the potency of that knowledge, AKA a gift, whether it's signs or symbols or whatever, in motion. Because when we keep our gift in motion, it continues to accrue power. So I have a quick story that I want to describe to you because I think it goes partially to why I work in this particular way, and then I'll wrap it up. And I have to kind of read my sequences through it, but it has to do with, um, how many of you know in, in, in Native uh, Plains related, Lakota, Nakota, Dakota, Native American traditions, the peace pipe? Do you know what it is? Okay. So a peace pipe in its raw materials is not a super elaborate thing. But what its job is inside of a tribe is that it's bestowed to a chief. And the chief, in the tradition, holds the peace pipe. And in that peace pipe, it's brought out at the most significant moments, conflicts, and difficulties across the tribal system. It is a point of reference. Stories are told, music is played, song lines are sung, et cetera, et cetera. And the peace pipe being present is imbued with cultural knowledge. The person who protects that knowledge is the chief because the knowledge has to then be retained, shared, and it's imbued in a person who has the discernment and consciousness and capacity to care for more than themselves to carry that through. And it's passed across generation to generation, generation, generation down the line. So at the point that knowledge, in this case, living in this pipe, gets changed fundamentally and permanently from what it is, is the moment that another system comes towards it, in this case, the system of commodity, and it's sold. Those peace pipes in different tribes were eventually sold for access to reservation land without death, after carnage. But this is the kind of gift that you can only sell one time because after that, it loses all of its knowledge power, its cultural trust, and what it's imbued to do across generational time. It becomes a commodity. And from that point, the raw materials later on in a commodity market mean that the native people will make a whole bunch of small peace pipes and sell them through a commodity at the market, at the blanket, at the trinket hawking of the wares the monetary system takes over the gift system in this instance. And the knowledge exchange is denied to the person of the acquisition through money from the person who actually carries wisdom. But there's a cultural reality also in terms of what I was describing around the arts. And this is why I work in it. If an artist decides to take that peace pipe now, and imbue it with the aesthetic integrity of finding form and meaning and value, and labors with skill and intentionality and care and imaginative realms, and manifests that now, disconnected from its original history, it now accrues again the knowledge, again the possibility, and again the value of becoming a gift, a gift that from that point forward stays in motion in service to cultural knowledge. The arts are a cultural asset and resource. And how we exchange our knowledge can be provoking, it can be widely, widely received, it can be experimental and contortionist, and it can be a variety of other things. But what it says is, the vulnerability of my pursuits in thought and, and idea and knowledge, I seek to manifest in the form of a gift that it will awaken a perceptual capacity within your knowledge, and therefore we collaborate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. And to all four of you, thank you so much for those presentations. I think as Vic suggested at the beginning, let's stand up, take 90 seconds if you want to jump around, <laughs> shake it out for a minute, lean over to a neighbor, do that. We'll do the same up here and we'll be back online in about a minute and a half. Thank you everybody so much. And those were just such terrific, terrific presentations each on their own. I think um, I, I want to first turn to the four of you and, and having listened now to the other three, are there, what I, what I really appreciate is the extent to which you were acknowledging and aware of things already being spoken of mm -hmm. here on the sofa and stage. Um, now standing back for a minute, a few minutes later, any, any thoughts about, uh, I, I don't know, unexpected convergence, coincidence, or uh, um, ignorance of ideas <laughs> beyond the ones you might have been thinking about? Any thoughts? Well, <coughs> maybe I could jump in with, I started to say this to you a moment ago. Um, there seems to be a convergence or an opportunity for us to think about education and the university and this notion of a gift. Because mm. um, on the one hand, while we're a land-grant public university, we have a tuition, that students have tuition that they pay in order to learn, in order to have access to knowledge. But on the other hand, this passage of knowledge, this sort of firmly held beliefs in the value of what we have learned is a gift. And I think oftentimes it's given as a gift. So I wonder if we could just talk a little bit about the balance between education um, becoming a commodity mm -hmm. and education as a gift. And I, I think that probably you all have a lot to say about this too, but Maybe we could start up here. Yeah. <laughs> well, <that's the> <laughs> well, okay, ladies first. Um, I, uh, I often think and reflect on the fact of, you know, education, me through, you know, my mother was born on the Indian Reservation, I was born not far from there. The, the kind of ability to climb and do different kinds of things and have facility or flexibility or fluidity in a broader world due to education, public education. So for me, I always think of it from the perspective of an infrastructure that was put into practice that it, it means that future generations, some, I'm, I'm cognizant of the fact that someone or a series of someone's took a benevolent interest in the fact that I would have access to an education. I am also the kind of person who thinks when I'm driving on roads of the people who work their asses off to build these things in the hot sun, et cetera, et cetera. I think of these shared spaces and I think of them as um, hmm. hugely the consciousness to acknowledge that the efforts, the knowledge, the skills, the labor, the practices um, of others make a framework possible for how I am able to stand within. And that to me is the gift of education in a certain kind of way. And the warning in it is that we feel possibly um, only thinking of its value in terms of what the investment monetarily is. And those piece, you know, that piece is a deep, deep provocation. Um, if an educational system turns itself into a commodity-based market, then the gift of the sense of public intellectualism and sharing and stretching and striving, having your soul stretched, your life stretched, your, your, your means stretched, um, changes. Mm -hmm. It's the same, in, I mean, working in the arts, when people will say, you know, please curate and put on stage that which is most popular, so that the tickets will sell out, so that there will be a resource platform inside of there, which isn't looking at the scholarship of the form or things like that. Mm -hmm. It's like I have Sweet Honey and the Rock um, in the house at Royce Hall right now. They're rehearsing, they're vocalizing, they've been through the civil rights movement. There's a soundtrack of an entire set of multiple generations. And you know, they are not there for the paycheck. The paycheck is a resource that keeps the gift of their song in motion so that they can do the deep work 
of continuing to provoke the song lines of civil rights, how they merge with hip hop now, and how they as a group of women stand in the power of their bodies to make meaning manifest amongst strangers so that we have collaborative lines of relationship with one another in secular time and space. Mm -hmm. well, that's part of an education here, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I talked long enough. The, the, if I may, Victoria, I think um, your, your invitation um, is a very good point of entry into um, sort of uh, the models that flow from uh, the logic of the market, uh, which really fundamentally forms consumers, uh, to the ethic of, of, of the gift, the ethic of giving and receiving, um, of forming um, uh, that is what animates the work of, uh, of education and the work of, of, of knowledge. So you have very different points of entry and very different destinations when, you, when the logic of the market becomes the driver of how we think about uh, education. Uh, the work of education, this is why I started with Dewey, is really the work of, um, of citizenship. When the Greeks first imagined what we now would recognize as formal education systems, uh, it's very fascinating because the nexus to, to the market and to the labor force was very low in the thinking of what are the purposes of education. The Greeks imagined education in the context of uh, the idea of the eudaimonic flourishing of human potential to its maximum capacity. Um, in the formative moment when education becomes a public um, good, the idea of a, of the, the, when societies arrive at the moment where public education becomes a normative ideal the, work, the world over, this wasn't, a, 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 the, the spirit animating the, that movement was the spirit of citizens of citizenship, and it was in fact in the context of the last previous wave of mass migration when public education became an, an instrument of the state to create shared experiences, to create a com common bonds in the citizens that we are arriving in, in our case, and we can talk about Germany as a different sort of uh, uh, a model, but uh, in a society of consent, like the United States, what do we have in common? And then it's education, it's citizenship, it's the point of entry into the, 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 uh, the, the, public, uh, the public sphere. And it's interesting that in the, in, the no, in the moment when public education becomes a normative idea the world over, the, um, the fundamental debates were driven by philosophical claims and arguments. Uh, in Europe, Durkheim became the first professor of pedagogy. You're going to have to get him on next week's mm -hmm. thing. What is the university? Uh, that's, yeah. it, it, the, the first professor of pedagogy is Emile Durkheim, mm. who is uh, maybe one of the fathers, certainly of French sociology, sociology mm. more broadly. Mm. It, if you look at the evolution, and in, in our country, it was, of course, um, uh, James, Dewey, uh, uh, in, in Italy was Maria Montessori, in South America was the great Paolo Freire. The idea was the nexus between the individual and society. This is Durkheim's famous mm -hmm. formulation. 50 years, you fast forward, this is 100, 150 years ago, I think Durkheim takes a chair in pedagogy, I think at Bordeaux, maybe in Paris, I can't remember now. And he becomes the first professor of pedagogy uh, in the world, really. Um, 
in this second fundamental moment in, in the idea of public education, it's all uh, the cognitive psychologists and the cognitive revolution. It's, it's Jerry Bruner uh, and his students, Howard Gardner, so many others. Today, the logic of the market has completely invaded how we think about education. Economists are all of a sudden the grand viziers of what is an education worth pursuing or worth supporting for a democracy. This would have been incomprehensible in the formative moment when so much of the basic questions about education what about the good society? Mm -hmm. What about citizenship? What about empathy? What about the common good? Not about how do we extract value from labor? Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting that uh, you mentioned in passing uh, Paulo Freire and pedagogy of the oppressed. Of course, this is another avenue where you have an opportunity to think of an educational system that's very much not top down or driven by that kind of master model, which is there in the history of pedagogy. I mean, even the term pedagogue is a, is a master who led children. That was where it came from. This, of course, changed over time, <laughs> and thankfully so. But it had a sense of hierarchical, um, you know, you had knowledge, it was passed down. Pedagogy of the Press was really inverting that in very fundamental ways and creating a much broader community of practitioners and participants in a kind of dialogical, open, you know, and obviously dialectically inflected way. He was very much inflected by, by Hegel and Marx, and that was sort of the basis of, of the critique, which again brings in the critique of capital, right? And the critique of capitalism and, and those who have and wield power in various ways. So I think this is an avenue to me that, that we want to reclaim, that we, want, that we really want to pri prioritize when we think about education, is, is that tradition that I think Ferry, and, and, and really going back probably to Marx, uh, also you know, really brought to the fore. The other thing I wanted to respond to, you know, the German tradition is interesting too, because the word kind of for education there is, is Bildung. And there it means, it comes from a sculpture, which means like you can turn, you can make something. You know, and it also has mm -hmm. a sense of image. It can be like in the image of God, um, because that was one way to think about it. But it was also a sense of formation or creation or making. But you really have a sense of artistic practice there. And mm -hmm. it's very much open-ended. Uh, mm -hmm. It didn't necessarily lead in one particular direction. And when the German universities in the early 19th century were founded, um, kind of thinking again in terms of like Humboldt and others, and this, these, these idea of liberal education, this became important to the United States. This was really a tradition that was of the multi-sided uh, education of the human being. Disciplines were not meant to be you know, silos, but were meant to be traversed. And education was really holistic. It was about thinking about the, the human being uh, and as, a, as a whole. So you know, to, be, to be educated is also to be formed. And form is never uh, a teleological. Right. The other, the other inversion taught is, of course, Maria Montessori and Cristina Rinaldi, Reggio Children, where the child is the, the point of entry right. into teaching and learning. Exactly. It's who's teaching whom. Exactly. Uh, we were in Erice recently in Sicily, and uh, Cristina Rinaldi, who is, uh, runs the Reggio Children, these are the best preschools uh, in the world, uh, starts with, so who is teaching who hmm. here? <laughs> and of course, Montessori, Rinaldi, so many others, the moment you put the child at the center mm -hmm. of teaching and learning, you have a radically different idea that inverts this mm -hmm. uh, yeah. hierarchical um, story that mm -hmm. we know so well in the education. I'm going to open the conversation to the floor in just a moment. As a transition to that, one thing I'm really struck by across the four presentations is a, a sense of responsibility brought very close to bear on any idea of knowledge that we might contemplate. And, and I guess an obvious question for each of you, or any, that, any of you that might want to take a stab at it, would be who do you feel most responsible to in thinking about your own work and thinking and performance or scholarship or, or participation as a, as a producer, understander, communicator of knowledge today. Who, where does the responsibility lie in your own thinking, in, in the work you do? Mm. Is it to your peers? Is it to your audiences? Is it to, 
Is it to yourself? Is it to a larger category of being? Um, okay, I'll give it a try. <clears throat> mm. um, I, I couldn't say that there would be one. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that there are constantly multiple spheres of responsibility. Um, of course, I, I don't even feel, I don't feel responsible to myself. I simply feel passionately engaged with learning more. Yep. I feel responsible to all the people who work with me in the process of creating something. In fact, that process sometimes um, becomes the most important thing. And then I feel fascinated by the process and responsibility of what happens to this thing that I make when it enters the world, when it becomes something that for a few moments can be engaged mm. by others. Oh, that's my mm. time. Mm. And I think it's a responsibility. What I find most gratifying is I write about immigration when <laughs> I give a talk and a young person comes and tells me, yes, this speaks authentically to my experience. Mm. I feel that is maybe the most gratifying space for me to be in when somebody, a young person, often says, you know, this tells my story. And to me, there's nothing greater than that the faithful um, uh, representation mm. of the voices, the dreams, the ambitious, the, the ambitions, the anxieties of people that teach me. Remember, I'm an anthropologist, and in anthropology, the only right you have is the right to be ignorant about the people. As the great Cliff Geert said, lo knowledge is local knowledge. It lives with your colleagues, and your, the endeavor becomes constructing a set of understanding that is faithful to the experience of mm. your collaborators. Hmm. It's, a, it's a question that I wrestle with constantly. Um, and I feel that there's an ethical dimension mm. in the work that I try to do, and I also am conscious of my failures to be able to take on mm. um, that responsibility. And I mean that by, mm. I have a voice and I have a certain amount of privilege that comes with it um, in various domains, um, yeah. you know, whether it's being male or able-bodied, um, Caucasian. And I think that there's an obligation to understand and be critical of that privilege, but also what it means to stand open and be willing to listen to voices that don't have the same opportunities for amplification. Um, and that's where the responsibility comes from when I'm thinking about the archive or these, these voices that I was mentioning. I mean, you become a kind of a, a steward for knowledge, a, a possible conduit, but also one who can refract it in different ways, but knowing that you're also extremely, it's a very precarious uh, position and, and you, you, you have to ask yourself, or I ask myself constantly, what, what, what responsibility comes with that? Yeah, thank mm. you. Mm. Yeah, I love that. I'll, for me, you know, similarly, mm, responsibility, privilege, you know, all these different kinds of things. I can look at it on the one hand as a human being walking around in the world and I can say that, uh, you know, like my kids, my mother. My mother died this summer. My kids are in growth. The bodies of knowledge that I have did not prepare me for either of those things, and yet somehow I'm able to draw from something that came to me from somewhere, et cetera, et cetera, to navigate those points where you do have to flip towards wisdom and rely deeply on ignorance, and the lack of knowing in a blind way doesn't absolve you of responsibility to care. So I think of it in that term. When I think of it mm. curatorially speaking, mm. which is a similar kind of thing from you know, curare, mm -hmm. the, the caring of, to care mm. for the thing. And mm. that is a job description, in my humble opinion. The rest are just acronyms and business cards and things, but that's a job description. But when I think of it, I think of it through the eyes often of um, a, a theater director, a profound theater director, Ariane Manushkin. They perform, she's based outside of Paris. I asked her one time how she prepares the cast to perform the work for like the 300th, 400th time. 
with such intensity because of the subject matter that they deal with often in the work. And they get together beforehand and they <coughs> stand in a kind of huddle and she says to them, tonight there will be someone in the theater who has never been here. We perform for that person. Mm -hmm. Tonight is also a person that will be the last time they're in a theater. We perform for that person. My sense of responsibility mm -hmm is the belief in that potential. Mm. Terrific, thank you. Mm. Amazing, well, uh, and I'm gonna, let's turn it and open it up to the floor here. I've got, just to start, we, our TAs have got microphones with some of the students. Let's begin there. Kyle, you've got someone here? Yeah, please. Hello. Thank you all for coming tonight and presenting. <laughs> all the presentations were amazing. Um, my question is, how do instructors or institutions determine what is better for students to learn and what is the process that goes behind what knowledge is best passed to the students? Yeah. Hmm. And this is for everyone. I'm going to leave that to the academic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you so as school. a dean, I would say the following, which is this really lives with the faculty and the autonomy of the faculty and the faculty's judgment as pertinent to the, to the, uh, to the, the, the very thought thoughtful and thorough question you posed um, is, um, uh, so really there, there is a, a ways in which um, the disciplines organize themselves and the individual faculty members have a great deal of latitude as to how to engage in the endeavor of teaching and learning and working uh, with, uh, with students. So there's a great deal of autonomy while I think uh, the, the disciplines hold a very important space in how teaching and, and learning are, are organized. Um, ultimately, faculty members um, really have the autonomy and the range to act, actualize mm -hmm. those general principles in the classroom. Well, I think um, when I decide you know, what knowledge should be passed forward, let us say, when I put a syllabus together, I made some decisions as to what we're going to read and what we're not going to read, and what we're going to watch or not watch if it's a yeah. film or art. And, and, and those decisions you know, are, are always one, one you, can qu you question them constantly. And, and it's not that you do this one time. It's constantly asking yourself what knowledge should be practiced or passed you know, forward. For me, I'm interested in texts or documents that will, that will haunt, that'll stay with you mm. as you grow, mm. and that you'll come back to in different ways because they mean things perhaps differently as you encounter them at different points in your life. And I often select things that that's happened to me. Uh, so I may have read something when I was 20, and when I'm 40, I'm going to read it quite differently. And I imagine when I'm 60, I will read it again differently. Um, and that's, that's actually part of the point, uh, because it also bespeaks a process of growth that, that I go through and that you will go through. Mm. I mean, nothing is static. I mean, every, again, who you are is constantly changing and evolving. The language you're using, and I don't mean just the language you're speaking, although I do mean that, but I also mean the expressiveness and the way we, we encounter um, a, a text. And it doesn't have to be written, of course. I mean, it can be performed. Um, these things all change. And so I'm, I'm interested in things that'll, that'll haunt us, though, and that things that we have to reckon with more than once. Thank you. Uh, over on this side, Jing Jing or Anna, do we have someone on There's that someone side? right here. Where are I? Sorry, I'm looking. Oh, yes, right here, please. It's on. It's, yep. Sorry. OK. <laughs> um, hi, and thank you all uh, again. Where? My question is, if knowledge is as valuable and scarce as we've been taught, why does society push education on everyone? <laughs> Wouldn't that take away from the quality of knowledge itself, or is it that we're only subject to limited truths and the full lengths of information should be protected? Thank you. Hmm. So well, knowledge is imperfect, and it's a, a perpetual. And <coughs> there's also such thing as progress, meaning the, the fact that 
uh, more people become educated and more people um, are um, 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 familiar, to go back to Victoria's point of entry, um, makes for a, a, a more democratic um, society where more voices in the citizenry uh, can weigh in on the on the on the issues of uh, of the day. So the pursuit of knowledge is eternal because knowledge is imperfect and incomplete, and it, knowledge is never extracting truth from facts and from nature, from archives. It's a make. It's more like making sausage. <laughs> it's not so pretty up close. Um, and uh, we make mistakes and we, we come back. Uh, we accumulate knowledge. Um, we go past previous traps, previous mistakes. Uh, so it's a, it's a perpetual endeavor. It's never, I think, and I thought Franz, that a work of art is never finished. It's abandoned. You can say the same about knowledge. The pursuit of knowledge is never finished. Some of us abandon it earlier than others, but it's <laughs> something that you have a career in politics in some countries. If you do that now, <laughs> tragically, that's not meant to be funny. Um, but um, that's why it, it, it revisits us in different ways in different generations. I didn't fully, totally understand the elements of the question, or I missed them, or they got left in the sea of response. But I did have a response that came to mind and that I think has some relational value. And that's, you know, to me, when I think of like going to university or going, you know, the pursuit of an education, there's the difference between a pursuit of an education in order to have a certification at the end. And that certification at the end brokers access points to a particular um, working life um, that leads, if you know, further tightened up the screws of perfection towards expertise, right? Really profound expertise. And that's one thing. There's also that place where the encounter with so much other gives us a way of recognizing elements of what makes us feel awake to ourselves in the world, which is significant. And to be pressured and stretched in those places of choice, to me, is a really important piece of it, which can be that the path of expertise is abandoned in service to working in a garden in the land or doing something else that is ultimately another kind of knowledge. But how all of those things are interdependently knowable, to me, comes through the frameworks of a pursuit and willingness to be educated. Thank you. Right, right here in, the, in front. And then we'll go over on the side, OK? Yeah, it's on. No? Oh, OK. Um, I wanted to ask you all uh, about the fundamental desire, the human desire for knowledge, and uh, what role you feel passion and desire and love play hmm. in, uh, in knowledge, and, and fundamentally our desire to exchange knowledge. We're homo sapiens sapiens, and there you have it. <laughs> because you guys Where talked about food and air, and I think sex yeah. over here at the beginning you talked about. Mm -hmm. But how does, how does knowledge fit into that? Did she talk about sex or horniness? Let's be clear. <laughs> oh, OK, sorry. <laughs> Carnal knowledge, I guess. Carnal. Mm. <laughs> I think that we have a, a continuous desire, not to say sex, Enos, mm. um, to be in relationship to engage our environment, whatever that is. And so I think that if knowledge is continuously learning how to converse with the world and the people around us, mm -hmm. and whatever scale that is, um, it, it seems like that, that curiosity, that inquiry comes, as you say, mm -hmm. because we are 
part of the world. Mm -hmm. I don't even want to say because we're human. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I think passion has a great deal to do with it. I think love, I think all of those things. But really, in a certain kind of way, if, we, if, if there's an openness towards observation, listening, and so on and so forth, every sensory apparatus that we have available to us is, gonna f is going to f make us fall towards knowing. We will fall towards knowing in one way or another. And to me, it's that thing of when you start to recognize that, your mind can start going in all kinds of places, your body, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think, I, I certainly know when someone has a passion to run out of the room because the subject matter that they're experiencing is making them feel nuts. My, my son is going through that like mad right now. Um, there's a passion to move away from things, and I think that's another point of knowledge. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just utterly inevitable that within the frameworks of our belonging to life in our path, knowledge is going to fall out of our sleeves like notes on a page, you know? What we do with it is a different kind of animal. Mm. Artistically speaking, I would say that those bodies of knowledge associated with artists are utterly driven by passion. Mm. And a willingness to stand in acknowledgement of what is not known and bypass a knowable outcome in service to a possibility that didn't exist without the pursuit. Mm. That requires passion and a variety of other things. Mm -hmm. Thank you. One, let's do one more question. Uh, Rai, um, I see a microphone right up here in the middle. First of all, I just uh, I want to thank you guys um, for your vulnerability as a panel. I think the potential that the five of you guys have created by not kind of cementing yourself in your fields and being mm -hmm. open to uh, the vulnerability of your fields mm -hmm. has been really um, awesome for this discussion. And I'm curious how you perceive the word amateurism, um, uh -huh. amateur to do something for the love of it, um, mm -hmm. and how that has been, um, you spoke about, you know, by monetizing the peace pipe, it, it actually takes away the power of it. And mm -hmm. as a part of this millennial generation that, um, I don't know, how has amateurism been, hmm. been used to keep people in their place or in their lane mm -hmm. for lack of a better, term, um, especially the, the young, or the, the youth mm -hmm. generation through, mm -hmm. throughout history, not mm -hmm. just ours yeah. um, in the current yeah. moment. Yeah. Thank you. I would just ask, um, how is amateurism a, a, a significant aspect of your experience? I'm not sure what you mean. Um, I think it, it seeps into a lot of different fields, yeah. um, in, in the arts, yeah. uh, definitely. Also, you can look at amateur college athletics um, mm -hmm. and that not being monetized, the mm -hmm. billions of dollars that are generated in that field mm -hmm. um, is kind of s more specifically where I'm coming from. But I think the idea of amateurism, again, yeah. going off of the earlier question of, of where love um, yeah. and doing things for the love of it yeah. has yeah. been kind of stripped. You look at the rise of B corporations, right? There's this new business model specifically designed to say we are a business that actually cares when however many years ago historically that was just mm -hmm. a natural component of business and transaction but now we're we've created a an actual I don't know yeah in Spanish what's the word for love amor amar amateur amateurism it's yeah. the love of that's, that's what I'm exactly, exactly getting it's at it's the love yeah. of and to me all knowledge is relational. This is what 150 years of cognitive neuroscience finally has discovered. All knowledge is relational. It flows from the magic word that, um, that uh, Victoria used, which is curiosity. It's the wonder of being alive. And it's the love of that pursuit of understanding what eventually becomes codified into knowledge that I think drives this perpetual human mm. capacity for knowing, for wanting to know, for acknowledging, and for the uh, eternal magic that comes with knowing more about the fundamental big 
existential questions before us. So love is at the center. We did very fancy longitudinal models um, of how kids learn, and it's relational. That gets you the most uh, for your buck, if we can use that uh, mercantilistic <laughs> metaphor. Kids learn in relationship. I always walk into a school, and if the teachers are rooting for the kids, it's a good school. It's a great school when the kids are, reach, are um, uh, rooting. Uh, rooting for the teachers, exactly. because that's true love. Yeah. And there's a, a brief letter that is lost in the archives, yes. uh, Albert Camus. So he wins the Nobel Prize. He's a young guy, an Algerian um, immigrant in France. He does, his father is not around. His mother is mute and deaf. And he sits down. He wins the Nobel Prize. And he's in, like, in his 30s. He wrote the L'Étranger, one of the great novels. He sits down and writes a letter to two people, to his mother and to his teacher. Mm. And that is a letter of love, love mm. to his teacher. I would just say, in relation to amateurism for the love of, protect that place inside of your, you know, march to greatness, mm -hmm. utterly. Mm -hmm. Because the tyranny of expertise can be full of traps, traps mm -hmm. of exclusion, traps of unhappiness, traps of a variety of things. You know, mm -hmm. there's an artist that I work with named Taylor Mack, and I'll just quote him right here and now. He would say, Perfection is for assholes. <laughs> okay, meaning you're a little tight on that expertise thing. Yeah. So, um, but but that thing. I mean, if you think of it, what is what is a something that you know that you wish you didn't know? The likelihood is it would be something very personal, in mm -hmm. your experience. What is something that you know that you treasure knowing is probably also something deeply personal in your experience, right? What is something that you know that you feel compelled to share is probably something that both you were both taught or gain extraordinary enjoyment from that you want to pass on. And what is the thing that you have in your knowledge that you want to share purely for self-advancement, right? The crux between these different um, uh, intentions, right? To me, the amateur place of like, how do we use our hand? How do we use certain things? How do you derive both pleasure and meaning from self-discovery, self-manifestation of a hobby? Hold on to those things that you clock in yourself because they will carry and buttress you across much more than purely the success lines marching towards the end game of a particular expertise. Mm -hmm. The hobbyist matters enormously. Mm -hmm. I think that's it. Terrific, thank you. We've come to the end, everybody. I love that at the very end of every session, they'll turn to our guests and say, any final comments, any a final thought? And if I were to ask, please, knowledge is? <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of feel like it's really hard to make a conclusion other than where we had just landed, because there were so many mm -hmm. really profound ways to yeah. both think about knowledge and to find the register for yourself inside of that. Thank you. Mm. Absolutely. I just want to say thank you to, the, yes, to all thank of you. Yes, thank you very much. Your, thank you. Everybody, Christy Evans, Paul Pesco, Marcelo, Victoria Marks, thank you so much for sharing thank your you. knowledge and helping us with all of ours. Thank you. <laughs>